honestly. Yeah. Well, Just in a Halloween spirit, I just want to scare everybody real quick. We just want to thank everybody for being here with us, usually, just to, to come here and, and worship our Lord, and we welcome you here for that. Um, one quick announcement, Bob Poole is doing wonderful. But he called me this morning and said, please, no food. He says, I don't know what to do with all the food people are bringing. He said, keep praying. He says, I'm going to have to lay low a little bit. But please stop bringing the food. Yeah. Chris says, if you, if you got extra, <laughs> you're more than happy to pick that up. Uh, before we even it start today, we have a couple guests here today that want to offer something to our congregation as the, there's going to be a live nativity up in town, but I'm not going to steal you guys' thunder. So we have Carol, and again, what's your name? Sarah is here, and they just want to explain uh, a few things. So I'm, I'm giving you guys. We just talk really loud. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Sorry, loud. Sorry. Um, it's so good to be back here. Carol and I are here because we're serving at the Alvin X Faith Coalition. And what that is, is a group of churches in our area have come together so that we can do large events to share the joy that we have in Christ. And uh, as we began, I have scripture, because scripture is always a great way for me to go. But I was reflecting on Jesus' prayer at the end of John. And it says, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And there is so much that is going on. I know if we were able to talk about all of the different things in our lives that have been trials this year, last year, we're, we're praying that this experience is going to be a moment for people to have peace and joy, and if they don't know Christ, to come to know him. So why are we here? We're here because I am over the production part as a live nativity. We're going to have a couple of different stations. And at these stations, we're going to have some monologues. We also have some uh, guides that are going to usher our groups through and have some great interaction time with people. So I'm looking for anyone who is pretty excited about talking with people, sharing who Christ is, and just in general, just loving life. So. Um, I know also we have Carol, and Carol, I'm, I'm doing all the talking to you. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, a member of the community, I live on Parsons Island, and I'm, I'm known as Bullock from Algonac. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what you say on your bulletin this morning, taking Christ to the community and bringing the community to Christ, that sums it up, that spells it all out. And that's really what the measure of the live nativity is calling in our community. And so I, I just want to thank you all for the privilege of being able to come here. I was met with such hospitality, such grace and friendship, and I, I just thank you for that. And that's really what we want to present to the community at large. And I, you know, I'm running the volunteers. So I've already had a few that have come to me. Are you interested? You need you need volunteers, and I can't believe that. I mean, within five minutes of stepping inside the building, got it. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for having us come today. Um, there's a few cards here that I can leave. I noticed there are cards in the van. These kind of spell out some of the uh, setup because that's really kind of the behind the scenes. We really, we're really gonna need some help with setting the tape down. So I'll leave the cards at the back of the table. And if you fill it out, we'll come and pick them up. And then uh, also if you can have it, so if you can send these out, not really send them out, but hand them out, or just have them available. Um, and then if you have any questions or you'd like to get in touch, we're at albanacnativity at gmail.com. So, it's also on the card, and 
Um, I understand that this congregation loves science, so there's a couple of yard signs in the back if you'd like to post one in the community. And we're very appreciative of it. And even though it's, it's Halloween today, we know that Christmas is coming, right? It's yes. <laughs> only about like six weeks away. So. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. We just are so thankful that we're able to celebrate Jesus together. Thank you. Thank you. Never mind. All right. Just uh, real quick, don't forget tonight, today, we're having our trunk or treat. And so what we just do is we you bring your car into the parking lot and we open up the trunks and the, the kids get to come around and get all kinds of candy. I don't know where that was when I was growing up, but uh, it's amazing how much candy these kids can accumulate in the month of October. And so... We are doing this along with the city of Algonac has everything going across those at, uh, at the Smith Park today too. So make sure that be part of it. It's just a lot of fun in doing so. Uh, we're this Wednesday. Oh, I'm getting the thing. We do have a sign-up sheet. Is this on one side? There's one that's one-sided. Come right down, and the moment the food has to go around. Okay, this is the food one. We're, our harvest dinner is November 14th, a Sunday. And so, I'm giving you all these. <laughs> Might take all service to fill them out. Um, if you've never been to our harvest dinner, please come. It's going to be at the Algonac Lions Club. It is just, the food is amazing. The fellowship is amazing. And we just like to get, bring family, bring friends. Bring neighbors, bring people that you don't like, and maybe you can start liking them again. And so, nothing like you know, working over some kind of misunderstanding with food. And so, again, this is what it is. So, fill this out. We want to just pack that place and just enjoy everybody's company as we are there. Um, like I said, our youth is going to be meeting this Wednesday, our 412, our kids in, kick, uh, kids in Christ. We will not have our adult Bible study because, and pray for Brenda and I, we're gonna head out Tuesday night, we're gonna go see our daughter, Heidi, in, in California, so we're gonna take a little trip just to go see her, so, again, we'll be back late Sunday. So, also, don't forget, next Sunday is fallback. You get that hour of sleep, so make sure you move your clocks back, it is daylight savings time. Got a couple birthdays. Yeah, Jerry. What? It's going to be, when's your birthday? Seven. Yeah. <laughs> Today. And look what I got for you. You know, a couple weeks ago, I forgot, and I didn't know we didn't have it online, but Janet, you had a birthday just a couple weeks ago, did you not? Yes, I did. And so, I have, a, I have a birthday cupcake for you as well. Yeah, no, you guys will try to eat it. No, I'm just... <laughs> There's some people you trust and some people you just can't. <laughs> also, if you never got a chance to meet her and talk to her, I just love Bree. Brenda picks her up and Bree has been coming. She'll come Wednesdays a lot. She'll come Sunday. This is her last Sunday here. She's going to be moving. And so we're going to be sad. But also, you have a birthday coming up November 15th? And so I got <laughs> so I got to make sure I have a cupcake for you as well. <laughs> One other thing, we always do during Thanksgiving, we do the, the grocery bag where you get the grocery bag or the brown bag. If you look, Dawn's holding one up if you want. She's my Vanna White today. And so... <laughs> What we're going to do a little different because of the struggle I've had over the last kind of two years is, you know, they'll have a sale on turkey. And I'll just go in there, why can I, I need 20 turkeys. Why can't I just get that sale price? Well, now they, no, no, no. So we have, what, 12, 15 bags that we're going to do. And we want you to partner up with somebody so that two people go together, get the groceries, and then with the sale, you've got to spend so much to get to turkey sale to purchase the turkey so two people together working and then we can then 
present them that Sunday before Thanksgiving. So we have them back there. We got 15 to do. So find a partner, partner up, and we're going to do that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity today. Just to come here with family and friends and just feel the warmth of your love. We just ask, as always, you just calm our spirits. Let us just give you our anxieties, our problems, and let us just focus on worshiping you today. Let the word just resonate in our hearts. Let your spirit just surround us today as we come here just to sing praises to you, to listen to your word. We thank you so much that we are allowed to be here, that you allowed us to get up today. Let us just rejoice in it with all our hearts. And it's your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ. is from Romans 6, 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin, because how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Well, as you all know, Fifth Sunday is Family Sunday, and so I want you guys to let your inner child out a little bit, and we're going to do Peace Like a River, and so Asia's going to come help me with the motions on this. So, so just do them, do them along with us here, okay? I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river. Love like an ocean, I 
got joy in life, a fountain I've got joy in life, a fountain I've got joy in life, a fountain in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got love like an ocean, I've got joy in life, a fountain in my soul. I've got peace. Stay up here with me. Okay. All right. This without tripping over all the cords. <laughs> Benny, what's wrong? Benny? It's Benny. Come on out of there. Now, what is the matter with you? Check your heart? Okay. Asia, can you come check Benny's heart? And don't tickle him. Okay. <laughs> What's Benny got in his heart today? Monster fruit snacks? <laughs> and, and Jesus is in your heart. <laughs> so, okay, let me get this straight. Are you trying to tell me that you've got fear in your heart? <laughs> Don't you know that doesn't mix with having Jesus in your heart? Jesus came to give us a sense of peace, not fear. Oh, you saw a monster on TV? Was it a big monster? And was it a scary monster? Asia, he shouldn't be scared of the TV monster, should he? Yeah, that's right. We're not supposed to be afraid. We're supposed to be proud, and we're supposed to be happy, and we're supposed to let, trust that Jesus will take care of us. Yes, he will take care of you all the time. Yes, he'll take care of Asia, too. No, there are no monsters out there. But you don't need to be afraid. That's what the point I'm making is because God's bigger than the monsters. That's, that's right, Benny. We don't need to be afraid because God is bigger than everything. Okay, you feel better now? Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, let's put his heart back in. Kind of needs that. Got one long vein. <laughs> <laughs> the next song we're going to do is a little silly but it has a good point to it my grandkids like this one a lot God is bigger than the good and bad. He's 
stronger than Godzilla and the monsters on TV. Yes, God is bigger than the good man, and he's looking out for you and me. Try it with me. God is bigger than the good man. He's stronger than Godzilla and the monsters on TV. Yes, God is bigger than the boogie man And he's looking out for you and me So, I guess that's Kid Sunday. We've got to let the inner child out. <laughs> and everybody knows I'm a kid. <laughs> I might not be the kid's body anymore, but I'm a kid all through and through. Right, Asia? Okay, so go back and see. A little nervous today for some reason. Probably because she is the only one that came today. But we sometimes have problems with kids not being able to be here, so we make do with what we got. So, and she's the best. All right. When he rolled up his sleeves, he wasn't putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and thunder. turn our thoughts towards the communion service. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from 
Good morning. We're often reminded during a communion service to remember Jesus' broken body. And we should do exactly that. But we should also consider that his broken body has a twofold meaning. Not only does it refer to his physical body, but also this body right here, the church. We are the body of Christ. And just as his physical body was broken for our sins, so we, as the body of Christ, should be broken. In Psalm 51, 16 through 17, David writes, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. In Acts 2, we learn that after hearing Peter's message, the, Peter, the, the people were cut to the heart, broken in a sense. Luke 18, 10 through 14, we read, Two men went up to the temple to pray, and one, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at, the, at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. When we take his, this bread and drink this cup, symbolic of the brokenness suffered by our Savior for our sake, we eat brokenness and we also commit to brokenness. So what does that mean? Well, for us modern Christians, it means many things, but I think it especially means we give our radical individuality. It's not about me. It's not about meeting my needs. It's not about me picking what best serves me and my family. Rather, it's about submitting to our brothers and sisters. Ephesians 5, 18, through 20, 18 and 21, we read, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We submit to one another by giving up our wants and our preferences for the sake of the wants and preferences of others. And in this, there is true freedom. Freedom is an opportunity to do anything we want. Freedom is wanting God to restore us to what we were always meant to be. Freedom is, is escaping the world's false image of who and what we were supposed to be and being restored to the very image of God. And we are always meant to be like Jesus, who was broken for others. As we break this bread this morning, let us remember that because Jesus was broken, so must we be broken. Amen. Would you bow with me for prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for allowing us to be here today to worship you and to take this time to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. Lord, may we remember and take into account the brokenness that he he gave us. May, our, may we take on that brokenness and experience your spirit. We love you and we give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Luke 22, 19 and 20, we read, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. bow with me for an offering prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for uh, allowing us to be here today to uh, worship you together with uh, like-minded friends and family. Lord, we just uh, pray that uh, you will touch our hearts, that we may give in a, a joyful manner. And Lord, we pray that you will uh, grant us wisdom to use these uh, funds wisely not only in our community, but across the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
So I'll shake off these heavy chains And wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be I am rich Well, good morning again. I'm glad everybody's here. Again, just got to welcome everybody here. It just, it's fall and it's just a neat time of the year, but you know, be prepared because snow is coming, I know. But then that brings spring and then we're back into summer and then we're back where we are again here. So we'll just stay right here and just thank God that we can be here today. Today is Halloween. Today is Halloween. And again, as I was looking at this, I'm a history major. I kind of looked at some cool things that happened on this date. Like I said, I don't know if people remember who Orson Welles. It was back in 1938 on a radio station. He read War of the Worlds. And he made it sound like it was actually happening. And people freaked out. Out. They actually thought we were being attacked by Martians. Some might remember the great Houdini. And again, it was on this date in 1926 that Houdini had died. Back in 1517, Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis on the church wall and he challenged the teachings of the Catholic Church, which began the Reformation movement. There's a lot of churches that actually call today Reformation Day. But as significant as those historical events, there's still Halloween. We still seem to celebrate Halloween. It seems like somewhere along the line, Halloween became a national holiday. And a couple of things, I don't know if you know this or not, only Christmas out earns Halloween. Only New Year's Eve and the Super Bowl out party Halloween. Twenty five percent of all the candy that's sold in a year is sold for Halloween. And one of the neat ones I saw was that four hundred and ninety million dollars were spent on costumes back in 2019 for their pets. <laughs> Not people. It was for their $490 million. And I can't wait to see what you're going to put on those dogs of yours. <laughs> now, as I was thinking about this, I have preached or talked about every federal ho holiday that we've had. I've done sermons on all of those. And then I started thinking, I never did one on Halloween. And people would even think, why would you do one on Halloween? Well, I thought, why not? And so, the scripture was read already today, Romans 6, 1 through 7. I'm going to be talking about that. But since being a history major, I just want to give a brief history of what was called Hallow's Eve or Halloween. And it developed as a Celtic ritual. You know those Irish. They wouldn't listen to the Scottish. <laughs> but it was a ritual that the Celtics had started. Sam Ween or something it was called. In simplest terms, what it was, it was a festival. 
and it's celebrated with bonfires and different things. But this festival was all about changing from summer to winter, that change of time. And it usually took around November, end of October, or early November. And traditionally, they'd light a bonfire. The streets would be prepared and costumes would be worn to ward off evil spirits because they believed at that time there was a thin veil between, you know, as the seasons changed. And in that thin veil, again, the spirits could come out. Well, this is what they are celebrating or preparing. But years later, when the Christians came into this area, they tried to take away this heathen holiday is what they wanted to do. And so they wanted to convert people to Christianity. So Pope Gregory III deemed November 1st as All Saints Day. It was a celebration of Christian martyrs and saints. And then the 2nd of November, they celebrated what's called All Souls Day, a day for remembering those who have died. Well, All Saints Day later became known as All Hallows Day. And then the previous day, October 31st was known as All Hallows' Eve, which now we call Halloween. Now, despite the best efforts of the church, people still continue to celebrate Halloween with bonfires and costumes and focus on spirits of the dead. And then it traveled from Europe to the United States. And people originally in Europe would carve um, turnips, yeah, turnip. They'd make little, like, carved turnips. But when they got here, see, they didn't have pumpkins over there. Pumpkins were over here, and people said, you know, wouldn't it be a lot easier just to carve a pumpkin than try to carve a turnip? And so we started doing it. And then one of the big things that happened was in 1820, Washington Irving wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And that really got the ball rolling as far as Halloween and a lot of these things that were going. And then, probably the last 50, 60 years, it really took off because we have big candy corporations. And we have Hollywood. And we have all these things going. And so this is basic hard set. So, with this, I read a story about a preacher who decided, again not to baptize this young girl into Christ because that Sunday, like today, it was Halloween. And he was so concerned about this because this is the day that's really reserved for ghosts and goblins and the walking dead. And so for many people, Halloween is almost like celebrating death. And if you think about it, I can kind of understand that. Drive around Algonac. And you see tombstones and yards and ghosts and trees and all these different things. So we see that. I think it was Thursday night. My wife and myself and Jacqueline and Darren, her fiance, we went to Romeo. I don't know if you've ever been there. I forget what's the name of the street. So you've been there. <laughs> if you haven't, it's like mind-boggling. Like two blocks or whatever it is. And I mean, these people, it's not like I'm going to put a pumpkin in the yard. I mean, these people spend big bucks. It's unbelievable what they do. Now, most everybody who decorates this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek kind of a thing. They don't mean any evil by it. But there's no avoiding the fact that many people decorate their homes on Halloween, and it kind of represents death. And so this preacher was concerned about the effect it would have on this girl being baptized on a season that seems to celebrate death. Now, he took her confession of faith. He just felt, we need to wait because I don't want to do it during this time. Now, I understand what bothers this preacher. I get it. But I'm also convinced his fears are based on a few kind of false ideas. The first is which is that it would be wrong for this girl to be connected for her baptism with death. Why is he connecting the two? But we need to realize, and this is important, this is what we're going to be talking about today, is that baptism is all about death. If we look at Amy, or Benny, if we look at Romans 6, it says, Or don't you know that all of us were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? 
We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So in order to become a Christian, it's saying you got to die. You have to die to your past and you have to die to your old way of life, that you're going to have a new life. So there's going to be a change is what was written here. Romans 6, 2 says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Romans 6, 6 said, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And the theme continues in Colossians. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And then finally, 2 Timothy. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we also live with him. I like what how one preacher put it. He said, did you know because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's dead people walking all over the earth? And he says, I'm not talking about zombies, and I'm not talking about the undead. I'm not talking about dead men walking on death row. He said, I'm talking about that they are born again. They were once dead, and now they're born again because they are believers in Jesus Christ. We were alive to sin and dead to Christ. But in Christ, our position has changed. Our situation has been 180. It has been reversed. Ephesians tells us, God made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And he goes on and says, we used to be alive to sin, but dead to Christ. Now we are dead to sin, but we are alive in Christ. Again and again in the New Testament, we're told that in order to belong to Jesus Christ, we need to die. We have to die to our past. We have to die to our sinfulness. We have to die to our old way of living. And when you die, what do you do? You bury them. That's what you're supposed to do. Somebody dies, and you bury them. Baptism was God's way of driving that truth home. Baptism was meant to remind us that our past is now gone. The old man of sin is dead and buried. Our sinful past is dead and buried. It exists no more. It's gone. Now, there are some churches that try to make their congregation believe that baptism can be done by pouring on or sprinkling or some of these things. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Because we've got to make this make sense in our heads. Let me use this analogy. Let's just say, at this moment, I grab my chest and I drop dead. Now, the good thing is, we're only two blocks from Gilbert's. So just drag me over there. <laughs> and they'll have a funeral. And I know you people just cry like nobody's business because you go, oh, I'm going to miss that man. And then they're going to take me from there and they're going to take me to Oaklawn. And there they take my casket and we're sitting there and now it's time to bury me. Now I want you to think about this. How are they going to bury my body? Are they just going to open up the casket and sprinkle some dirt on my forehead? Or maybe throw a couple shovels of dirt in there? No. They're going to dig a six foot hole. They're going to drop me in there and they're going to cover it with lots and lots of dirt. Now, My body will be there. That's just my earthly body. My spiritual body, I know, will be with Jesus. Romans 6 tells us that when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we are buried with him. And that's why water baptism always involved a lot of water. John 3.23 tells us, Now John the Baptist also was baptized in Anion near Salem because there was plenty of water. Acts 8 tells us that the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, and as the scripture goes it says, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Now think about this. They said they went down into the water. 
they came out of the water. If it was just a little sprinkling of water or a splash, one of them probably had a canteen on them, and they could have taken care of that right there. But no, they went down into the water, and they came out of the water. You see, baptism requires a lot of water because it represents a physical death and a burial. Now wait, there's more. I want you to think about this. If somebody came forward today and said, John, I want to be baptized today. The water's ready. And we get in that water, and I put them under the water. I don't leave them there. Because then we get back to the story, well, let's go two blocks down to Gilbert's. <laughs> and they will rise out of that water. Because again, this is what it represents. And that is the genius of God. If you think about it, he designed your baptism not only to represent your death, but he also has it represent you coming out, a new life. You've now been resurrected. And again, that is so important because, again, Romans 6, 4 tells us, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may have a new life. We've been buried. And we come again for a new life. And it's important that we understand that. And so that preacher, I feel, was mistaken about baptism and Halloween. Baptism is all about death. Baptism is about the burial and a resurrection and all about a new life. But there's something else that this minister missed. Because he did call that girl up. And then the girl gave her confession of faith. And so he felt everything's good now because she's already been accepted. She's already born again. He believes she already died to her past. But he's putting off the burial of her past for a few weeks because he didn't want to do it then. It was inconvenient to do it then. But if you read scripture, people were baptized immediately upon making their decision of Christ. Every time somebody comes up here and says, man, I want to accept Jesus my Lord and Savior and make that confession of faith, we got him in the water. If you look at scripture, Acts chapter 16 talks, talks about a lady, Lydia, and how but Paul went down there and preached to him. And immediately, she says, I want to be baptized. And immediately they went, he told her, he didn't wait, he did it right then. If you know the story of Pentecost, and after Peter preached, 3,000 people wanted to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Peter didn't say, too many of you, fill out a sheet and I'll call you, and we'll get this done over the next six, seven, eight weeks. Immediately, 3,000 people were baptized that day. Going back to chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, and they were traveling, and again, Philip was explaining Scripture to him, and when he got it, it made sense to him. And he was convicted, and the eunuch said, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he was. They stopped the chariot. They didn't wait. Well, we better get some witnesses here. Just you and I didn't need witnesses. It was these two doing what Scripture tells us to do. Then in Acts chapter 16, we have Paul and Silas who were locked in prison. And let me read you the story. And it was about midnight. And Silas and Paul were praying and singing hymns. Right there, I just love it. They're in prison. What are they doing? They're not taking their little cups and up along the bars or, hey, I got to get out. I've been misjudged. Get me. No. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to me. I mean, they're witnessing in prison. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison was shaken. And at once, all the prisoners' doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoner had escaped. And that was Roman rule. If they escaped, you're going to die if you're a guard. But Paul shouted, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Don't harm yourself. Nobody's left. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. 
He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. Again, over and over, we see this happening. But why? Why immediately? Well, we've got to look at what does it represent. You have a body being dead to sin because you don't want to leave dead bodies laying around. I always had that conversation with my father. Dad, what do you want to do? How do you want? And he goes, when I die, take my body, put it to the curb, you know they don't leave dead bodies laying around. Somebody's going to pick it up. <laughs> and so that's what we did. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if a person is dying to their sin, you've got to bury them. I mean, even in the days of Jesus, you, could, you couldn't leave a body out. You even know in the story of Lazarus, when he... We're going to roll that stone. No, he's been there for four days. You can't roll that stone away. He's going to be stinking in there. So the question is, why do churches wait? Why don't they baptize people right away? Well, they wait because they don't believe baptism is involved in our salvation. They feel you're already saved. They'll say baptism is merely just a public declaration of a decision you just made. They're going to say that baptism is just an outward sign of inward grace. Now, I want you to open your Bible. Let's see if we can find this. Because you're not going to. You're not going to find this. Instead, the Bible teaches this. Again, excuse me. The Bible teaches the idea that we're all needed to be buried, and it's part of salvation. And it's not a relatively new idea here because from the very beginning of the church, this was taught that baptism was part of the salvation act. Every early church leader talked about baptism and they talked about how this is important. And somewhere along the line, it kind of faded it out in the 300s a little bit. When Christianity was accepted in the Roman Empire, they kind of overtook it and tweaked it. And then, beginning with the Reformation, and religious leaders had gradually started to drift away from baptism being part of the Salvation Act. And they've been t t teaching that all you need is a sinner's prayer, or ask Jesus into your heart. And again, let's open our Bibles and see if we can find that. And again, you won't be able to. You won't be able to. Instead, the Bible teaches us this. When you've been baptized into Christ, you have clothed yourself with Jesus Christ. Peter wrote, in the water, referring to just like it saved Noah and his family. It was a lot of water that was there that saved him. He said, symbolizes baptism that now saves also. Not the removal of dirt. You don't come in here, I'm not, you know, I'm going to throw you a bar of soap and say, man, you're good now because you're clean. No but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you're thinking, whoa, wait a minute here. I thought I was saved by grace of God through faith. Ephesians tells me this. Yes. Yes, you are. But our faith is shown by our repentance of sin. Our faith is shown by confessing Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Our faith is shown through being buried in the waters of baptism. Baptism is an expression of our faith. Colossians tells us, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Faith and baptism work hand in hand in our salvation. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. To merely... Be baptized without faith. To say, I just I want to get in the water, but I don't know why I'm getting in the water. 
I'm not going to make no confession. I just want to get in the water. We call that swimming. Because it has nothing to do with it. But to believe baptism is not part of the process is going counter to the teachings of the scripture. But there are those who say, do you mean if I'm not baptized and I'm not saved? And that's a legitimate question. It's one I've struggled with over and over before. And maybe you have too. Maybe sometimes it's hard to answer people. Maybe he's going, man, I don't know how to answer that question. What do I say? How do I do this? Now I want you to think about this. Because maybe you might have to answer a question. Maybe somebody would ask you, do you believe that if someone was be believed, repented, confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but is not baptized, are they going to go to hell? Now, how do you answer that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you an example here. I read this great answer. It was somebody who was teaching a youth Bible study. And he, I love the line of question he used, and I'm going to ask the same questions. Don't raise your hand. Don't give me the ooh, 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 I know. Just think about this. So here's the question. How many people know what a testament is? I'm talking Old Testament and New Testament. And some are going, oh, wow, well, man, don't call me on that one. Well, let me just break it down a little bit more. How many people know what a covenant is? And maybe a few more, oh, okay. Well, let me break it even down one more step. How many people know what a contract is? Everybody in this room probably has been involved in a contract one way or another. Now, stay with me on this one. With my madness here, just stay with me. Let's just say Mr. Smith has a house for sale. And he comes to me to sell it. So he comes to High Street Realty. Or, no offense, Kevin, but Algonac Realty. <laughs> if you people remember, that's what my dad did for a living. And he says he wants to put his house on the market. And he says, I want, want $200,000 for my house. But he said, there's one stipulation. I have this above ground pool that is so cool. It's one of a kind. You can't get it anywhere. I'm not selling that pool with the house. I'm taking it with me. I said, no problem. So I put my sign on the property. And with a few days, Mr. Jones comes into my office and says, I got to have this house. Here's $200,000 cash. And he tells me that he's always admired this house. I can't believe this man's selling a house. I always wanted to buy this house. This is my lucky day. Here's the money. And he's so determined that he wants to sign the papers right now. He wants to give me that money right now. But then he tells me this. Man, the main reason I'm buying this house because that pool in the back. I got to have that pool with that house. Now, he's accepted the offer. He's paid the money. Do we have a deal? No, we don't. In real estate, it's called meeting of the minds. It can be a simple matter of the color of a light switch or color of a room or whatever. But if both parties don't completely agree on the terms of the sale, there's no meeting of the minds. And therefore, there is no deal. Now, I could tell Mr. Jones and say, hey, no problem. Mr. Smith won't mind giving you the pool. You just give me your $200,000. And you can move in immediately. Can he? No. Why not? I don't own the house. It's not my decision whether or not that's a good deal. And I could tell Mr. Jones this. I am so sorry. There is no way, no how, that Mr. Smith is going to sell that house without taking a pool. So take your money, leave, or I'll show you another house. Again, is that true? No. I don't own the house. Mr. Smith wants to sell. If he wants to sell Mr. Jones a house, he's perfectly within his right to do so now. I mean, as a good agent, I might say, instead of $200,000, why don't you drop $210,000 down and tell him you're throwing an extra ten grand for a pool that's probably worth two grand, And he can go get himself a better pool. And I could do that. Does Mr. Smith have to accept this counteroffer? No, he does not. He can if he wants. Why? Because it's his house. And it would make sense. 
Now, what would happen if I, as the agent, just didn't bother to tell Mr. Jones about that small band of the pool? Got the money, going to take my commission, and I'll just... See, I'll let those two work it out afterwards. Not a good idea. I'll probably get sued. I'll lose my license. Now, this is how it all plays out. I want you to think about that now. You see, God has a house for sale. And we're going to call it salvation. He paid for that house with the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's no way I can ever repay that loan. But in order for us to accept his free gift, this is what the contract says. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have to repent of your sins. You have to confess Jesus as your Lord and Master. Being buried in the waters of baptism and rising into a new life. And then by living our lives for Him. Now, let's say someone comes forward today and says, You know what? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to repent of my sins. But that part about, you know, making Him Lord of my life, I don't want that part. I like the other parts. Those are good. They fit my life pretty good. But I don't want that other part. What this man is doing is offering a counteroffer to God. Now, if God wants to accept the counteroffer, that's up to God. It's his house. It's not up to me. But I wouldn't bet the farm on that happening because that's not how the contract is written. If I want to accept God's gift of salvation, I better do his terms rather than mine. Thus, if someone believes and comes forward again and repents and confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior, but says, you know what, I don't want to get wet, I don't like water. They're offering God a counter offer. I will do this, this, and this, but hey, what about this? Can we skip this part? That's up to God. That's not up to me. You're giving God the counter offer. And God can accept it because it's his house. I just wouldn't take the chance. I'd rather do the way the contract, the Bible, tells us to do it, how it lays it out. Now, what would happen to me? I want you to think of this. What would happen to me if somebody came up and said, well, I want to do this, this but I don't want to do that. And I said, no problem. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, now I violated the contract. James 3.1 tells us, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. God expects those who teach, God expects those who preach to know the Bible well enough to avoid misleading others on the things that God expects us to do. So I'm not about to leave baptism out of the picture for any reason. My job is to teach the Word of God. My job is to make sure I follow the truth. It's not what John High Street thinks. It's not what the elders think. It's what does the Bible say we need to do. And that's important because God is going to be the final judge. And it's our job to study the Word. And I say that over and over. It's your job as well as mine to continue to get you need to study it and see. You need to ask questions if there's questions. If you don't understand something, then you bring those questions to me or the elders or the deacons. We can send you somewhere. I'm not saying, hey, just, don't, hey, just take my word for it. I'm never going to say, hey, just take my word for it. You're going to be good. That's not my call. That's not my call. And so it's so important that I teach what the Bible teaches. It's so important that our elders and deacons preach and teach what the Bible tells us. Because it's God's job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's our job to love. That's the job that God has given us. To share His Word. To share His love. To show people what it's all about. To be a Christian. That being baptized, it shows them that Man, you knew me then, but look at me now. Because I walk in a new life. I buried those sins. I don't have to worry about those sins anymore. They're gone. I buried those. There was a story several years ago about a man who 
was baptized in Lake Superior. Now, the story takes place in late October, right around this time, and it was at night. And this man had been talking with his friend and his wife about accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They were going through the Bible. And then finally, the man said, you know what? I want to accept Jesus Christ in my life now. I want to be baptized now. And his friend went, like where? In Lake Superior. And he was kind of hesitant. He said, let's do this. Now, if you've never been in Lake Superior in the summer... You know that water's cold. Can you imagine how cold that water is in late October? And so the plan was to go so deep into the lake, but these waves were coming in there pretty high. And so they went about knee deep, and he laid them down and let the waves just wash over them real quick. But he was immersed, and a lot of water went over this man. And so. After they were done, they went back to the man's house. And they're sitting there and they're shivering. They're having some hot chocolate and they're sitting by a fire. And they're going, man, that water was cold. It was so cold. But the one man said, why? Why did you want to get buried in Lake Superior? We could have gone somewhere. There's churches around. But why? And he says this. He says, you know, I was in the Army. He said, I was an officer during the Vietnam War. I saw things, I did things that I'm so ashamed of that people shouldn't even think about or have to even think about doing. And I had those sins weighing hard on me. And I needed to do something. And he said, I wanted my sins buried in the deepest and the coldest place that I could find. And I don't know any better place than putting it all in Lake Superior. And that was perfect for it. This is what Jesus is asking us. He's asking us to accept him. Because of what he did for us. It's an easy step. He's not saying, oh, it's going to be awful. He said, there's going to be things that might be difficult. People are going to ridicule. But that's a good thing. This is not like I always said, a bunch of rules and regulations. I don't know if I can do all this. He said, no, you're not looking at it right. You're looking at it that you've taken your sins. They're buried. They're forgotten. It's like taking them to the middle of Lake Superior and putting them in a steel chest and dropping it. It's gone. It's not going to be found. And this is what God is saying. This is what Jesus was here for. He said, you're not going to have to worry about anything. Your sins are forgiven. When you come out of that water as a new person, you have a new life. That's what it's all about. That's what the Christian life is all about. It's a new life. It's a life full of enthusiasm. It's a life that you see things different. It's a life that you want to share because people can go, why are you so happy? What's going on? Why aren't you all just bent out of shape about everything? Because I gave it to God. And he's given me this day. And that's the only promise that God gives us is this day. What can I do to make the most out of this day? How can I rejoice in him this day? How can I show them just how thankful I am? And we show them how thankful we are because you want to witness. It's not knocking somebody down, hold them in a headlock and say, you're going to read scripture today. They're going to ask you. They're going to ask you, what do you have that I'm missing? It's not memorizing the Bible. It's just knowing that you care. It's knowing that you have something. This is is what it's all about. This is why we have this guy. This is having a family of believers to say, hey, we're all in this together, and it's a good thing. If you have problems, anxieties, man, there's people in here that suffer and find ways to get around it. There's people here to help. There's people here to pray for you. This is why I love this congregation, because you're willing to pray that quick. You're willing to help that quick. Why? Not because of anything else is that I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and that's what I want to do. Not that I have to, it's what I want to do. And that's why we always offer an invitation. If you want to come up here and make that confession, boom, the water's ready. If you need somebody to pray with and say, man, I've made a confession, but I still struggle, man, I have problems. We're here for you. Because it's all about love. It's all about love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. This day that you allowed us to get up this morning, that you allowed us just to focus on you, 
to sing praises to you. Now we just ask your Heavenly Father because we do fall. We do struggle. <coughs> Let us always stay close to you. Let us seek you in all things. Let us feel your love. Let us feel your warmth. Let us feel the forgiveness that you have for us. We're just so thankful that you've given us an opportunity to find a new life. That through that you said, here, I know you're going to have a new life, but you have a place with me in heaven. And we thank you for that. Let us have a heart that rejoices. Let us have a heart that is so full of enthusiasm. Let us just go out each day and just say thank you. And if you allow us to get up tomorrow, well, boom, let us get to do it again. And we thank you. Continue to guide us and direct us. Continue to give us your eyes and your heart, dear Heavenly Father, that we can see and do the things that we need to do. But more importantly, just let us have that feeling of love. Let us show the love that you showed us. Let us spread that. Let this be a congregation that's known for its love and helpfulness and its unselfishness. Continue to bless us, dear Heavenly Father. We love you. We adore you. It's your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we give our invitation. <coughs> Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. is calling